Welcome to Speak Sex. I'm your host, Eve Eurydice, and I'm in Miami Pride Month um, with uh, today's guest. So uh, I have my friend and co-writer, um, Farah, and uh, her friend, Rosen, um, who are both um, writers, poets, activists um, in in uh, and queer activists as well as writers um, so I um, I know that um, Farah has been working with uh, reading queer um, she they <laughs> we're gonna talk about pronouns <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> by by the end of this conversation, I will say everything in a in a in a respectful and inclusive way. Um, and what I find interesting about this topic is that um, I have felt this way emotionally for a long time, for decades, long before uh, you know sisters and, and, and brothers began to, to come up with a way to us to be addressed. Um, but it didn't occur to me way back when that I could actually involve others and the, and the overall consciousness in, in, this, in this feeling that I had. So I, I have always felt that I'm not an I. I have always felt that I am a we. Um, and that the I is patriarchy immediately, in, you know, from, from the very genesis, limiting, right, and, and defining um, my consciousness, my identities. It didn't occur to me to say our identities and their identities. And today, Rosen is going to talk us, to us uh, a little bit about Z, Zier, and Zers which I feel is even more interesting and exciting. But back to my introduction, um, I'd like you each to speak of your work, you know, for, for a minute, if you can. Farah Yemini um, is a graduate, right, of the MFA at FAU, and um, she, he, they... <laughs> um, <laughs> Are mentoring, right, mentoring uh, the SoFlo South Florida protest poets group um, that Rosen is a member of. Um, I believe that Rosen also um, is a member of Rainbow Rights Pack or maybe has founded uh, Rainbow Rights Pack. So, you know, their approach to poetry is in the form of activism, which I admire and appreciate um, in, in the form of protest, uh, whether it's spoken poetry or you know, performed poetry, written poetry, it includes uh, always, uh, you know, this intentional consciousness of uh, the fight for social justice and inclusion. So welcome to the show, um, Farah and Rosen. And um, yeah, I would like to open the conversation to this, um, to this, pro to a, you know, sharing about this practice of actively um, changing our our use of the language and and our and therefore our consciousness by asking those around us to address us in no, non-conventional, non-patriarchal ways. Um, and I, I totally feel that, you know, transformation st starts with language. Um, and, and, I, and I know how difficult that is because there is an endless process of translation as we try to communicate with each other. And, you know, we, we, we hardly, right, know our, ourselves uh, since we constantly are in flow and change. And, and then guessing the right words to, to try and, and share that with another, you know, guessing the vocabulary that the other will be familiar with, 
and, and open to, uh, you know, accepting and sharing is already kind of a leap of faith. And in the process, um, you know, asking to, to, to adjust, you know, to, to kind of like expand, you know, the vocabulary to include us more authentically um, makes it even more of a, of, a, of a kind of like, you know, brave task, I feel. So, um, yeah, I would love to uh, hear what you have to say about it. So am I going first? Sure. Or is, or um, I guess, yeah. Really, um, I, I really like what you have to say about language as like an emancipatory act, um, as uh, you know, it's an action of how we can relate to each other um, as we translate our consciousness and um, how I want my friends, how I want my community to see me, right? There's nothing more intimate than using the right language because you know that it's like an agreement. My message is received on the other side that this person is seeing me in this way that I want to be seen, you know? And so I really like how pronouns and how, um, language like just my um my language work right it's like my language movement cultural work um how it um everything that it can do right like you said it, it can expand us and um i i thought like i in the beginning i felt like i was a pain in the ass you know and i still do like i don't think that goes away when you ask people to expand themselves it's always you know, um, uncomfortable because we live in the patriarchy and um, it's invested in seeing this binary um, in in a certain way, right? And we're like altering that and we're um, expanding that and growing that. And so um, I used to thought like, I, I used to think I was the big shit because I would, you know, use they, them pronouns and, and you'd be like, well, I read you as a woman, so I'm gonna call you she be like, all right, so I know our relationship then, right? Like this, our relationship is how you want to see me and not how I'm asking you to see me. Um, and so that's also like, it's also like a litmus test, you know? It's like, are you on this path with me or are you not? <laughs> like, and so I know who I can count on and who are my people. Um, but then I met Rosen. <laughs> and Rosen like, <laughs> a whole new... <laughs> like a curve <laughs> to it. And um, when, when Z first, uh, ex when I heard them really talk and own that space of why they use Z's or Z's as their uh, preferred pronouns and as their pronouns, I was like really impressed. And um, I, yeah, I just want to like, you know, invite them to, to talk to me a little about it. They, I first heard them speaking on a panel called Queer Black Experiences um about you know the pronouns I when they first told me it was just like I was like okay I got you like I'm gonna I'm gonna start using Zer and Zers but when I really heard it it just felt it also felt powerful because and intimate at the same time which mm -hmm. I think is what yeah yeah the patriarchy is is trying to like keep us from connecting yeah. in this like genuine authentic way and yeah <laughs> Yeah, I love that. You know, I love that. I just want to take this mom a moment to just kind of digest that. Yeah, because um, I feel that, you know, superficially, uh, someone who's not familiar would feel, would, would experience it as alienating. You know, why can't you just be like me, <laughs> right? Uh, but it does, in fact, involve a lot of intimacy, the intimacy, you know, like linguistic intimacy um, and trust, you know, it's, it's a gesture of trust uh, that, that can be misread, uh, you know, if, it, if one doesn't take a moment and, and, and listen, um, because, mm -hmm. yeah, it's easier to fit in, you know, it, it's not that hard to say, you know, I'm a trans man or, or something that is understandable and, and then get to the point, whatever the point is. But then that's how we get, you know, capitalized and commodified and, and put them in our little categories and, and 
don't have a chance to to speak for ourselves and discover ourselves until we're like way deep in that in that in that kind of like conveyor belt feed. <laughs> so so you know to actually mm-hmm. you know express yourself and and share yourself in a way that that you know s- stops the automatic the automatic talk mm-hmm. right and forces us to to come from our consciousness i feel so uh, you know enriching and and powerful and inclusive mm-hmm. yeah thank you yeah <laughs> of course thank you for um just like setting the the stage for this. And I would love to hear, you know, Ro talk a little bit about, about their pronouns, about these Zer's pronouns. <laughs> yes. So sorry. Yes. So pronouns. So yeah, so then, so then we thought like what pronouns are. So a lot of people think of them as gender pronouns, but I, I just lean away from calling them gender pronouns. I just think of them as pronouns. Because it's not as simple as, oh, you have a gender, you have to go by certain pronouns. That's not true. And like a lot of times when people try to teach pronouns for the first time, they oversimplify it. And when they oversimplify, they end up erasing a lot of people's experiences. So how to explain pronouns, there are shorter ways to refer to someone. And like not everybody has pronouns, but most people go by certain pronouns. Or by any pronouns. So... Conventionally, women like the a woman can be associated with the pronoun she her, and men can be associated with the pronoun he him. But that's not always true. There are some women say they're gender non-conforming, especially are masculine. Some of them, especially I've seen like butch lesbians, various lesbians who go by other who still identify as women, but go by other pronouns. Like, like maybe they they go by they them. Maybe he goes by he him. But meanwhile, they they still identify as women. That's possible. And then men say they're more feminine presenting, or especially gay men, but they, they still identify as men and they go by they them, or maybe she goes by she her. So those those are, those are, those are men and women, and then there are non-binary people. So people who are not always completely or exclusively men or women, they're non-binary. And like non-binary people also go by any pronoun. So the most common pronoun, of course, that some people have heard of, but more often the photos like they, them. But non-binary people don't have to go by they, them. Some non-binary people go by she, her. Some, by, some go by he, him. Some mixed pronouns. And some people say go, go by he and they. Some go by she, he, and they. Some go by any pronoun. They just find any pronoun. And then there are people who don't go by any pronouns. Like whether they're questioning or maybe they, there's not a pronoun that feels right to them. So they just want to be called their name. Or next is the person's name. Say the person's name is Stan. Stan wants to be called Stan. You wouldn't call Stan they or he or she. You'd say Stan. This is this is my friend Stan. Stan is sitting in the chair. The chair belongs to Stan. And you just use Stan's pronouns. So for me, my pronoun is he, the, and the. Those are my pronouns. Right. And, that's, uh, and that's Z-H-I or Z-H-I-R, right? Well, how, well, how, how I personally spell it, like Z. C H E. I spell Zer C H I R, and I spell Zer Z H I R S. Mm-hmm. And that's how I personally spell. spell. And of course, I, I like to say I pronoun cousin because there are people with similar pronouns, but they spell it kind of differently. Mm-hmm. Like maybe they spell it out late. Like some people spell it Z E, for example, or they may spell it um, S E. And like, so there are different ways depending on the person. So I, I, I'm speaking for myself. I spell it Z-H-E for Z. Mm. So how I came across my pronouns, this is like back in like the second half of ninth grade. Let me go, like second half of ninth grade. This is like, by that, that time I met, for the first time in my life, two gender food people. And like that, they really opened my mind in terms of like, oh, wow, you don't have to be a man or, or a woman. You, you, you there, there are other options. And not say it's a choice, but like there are other genders that you can't identify as besides a man and a woman. And then so then I realized as I got on social media, I like can I read people's experiences, I was like, wow, I relate a lot to this. And I started identifying as gender fluid and I was go looking through pronouns, like look through a list of pronouns, see what feels right for me. And I saw it being there and and it and it hit right. It just it just hit right. And I was like reading about it. It's not super common, but in like in some in some instances, like in Britain, 
they'll use the endure on legal documents. So they'll be like, instead of being like oh. he slash he, or instead of being like plenty's as he, like the U.S. does, right. in some cases, they'll be like Z. Oh. And after the use exclusive. And like, I remember talking to a friend who I haven't written, and I mentioned that. And then she was like, yeah, she had seen it before, but she never knew that was why they used it. Interesting. Yeah, so that's how I came across the pronouns, and I adopted those pronouns. And like, they feel right. Sometimes people ask me, why don't you just use they, them? That's just so much easier. That's so much simpler. But at the end of the day, it's like you use pronouns that affirm your gender. So like, when people call me they, them, it's like, it's, 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 it's not, it's not like I'm offended unless, it's, unless of course they're doing it because they're just perfectly disrespecting my pronouns. But it's like, it's not, it doesn't feel right. I don't really feel like necessarily you're talking about me. When you use the and just like, yes, you're talking about me. Like if you call me she, that I'm, that, that really hurts my soul because like, I know you, like, especially because I make it very clear and when I meet someone like these are my pronouns, the and you call me she, like, no, that's hurtful. Especially growing up, that's what I was called and like, that doesn't feel right. If you call me he, that still doesn't feel right. It doesn't make me feel as gross, but it still don't feel like you're talking about me. And then they, I'll start they only if you don't know my pronouns. Like say, like you, 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 like you're referring to me and you don't know me, that's different. But like if you're coming, if you want to start talking to me, I introduce myself, hey, I'm Rosen, my pronouns are in Zer, I'm respecting you to use Zer. So I'm not like this unknown person where like you're using they because you don't know me. Of course, some people use by they, use they as their pronoun set. And that's a, that, that's okay. But if someone does not use they with their pronoun set, and you and you actually know them, you shouldn't be calling them they. And that's what that's what some people do. And I, at one point in time, I got into that habit of calling everyone they. But actually, coming across other trans people really asserting their pronouns, that really made me more confident. Like trans, some trans women who go by he, and trans women who go by she, they're really insistent. Call me she. Call me he, do not call me they. And it's like, well, I can actually insist on my pronouns. I can be like, call me Z. Like, I used to be like, oh, yeah, you think, like, I'd be like Z and Z, my pronouns would be like, oh, can I just call you they? And I'd be like, okay, yeah. And like, pretend I'm okay with it. But like, no. Now I'm like, no, these are my pronouns, Z and Z, and you need to call me, call me accordingly. Yeah. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I, I love it. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just <laughs> simply love it. Um, because I think it's an active participation in the creation of the language. So instead of a passive, right, use of the language um, for transactional purposes, um, it's an it's an intervention. Um, and I can imagine, a, a, you know, a world where we all each uh, had our own. Um, and how fun and creative and exciting and unique that would be and how much just that one simple like hack, that one simple tweak in the way we speak would change the language completely and thoroughly. You know, how many new words, sounds, meanings would be added to our daily speech if we each had a, a pronoun that we felt was appropriate and expressed that, you know, expressed our identity our truth. Um, so yeah, I love it. Um, and, and, and Rosen, um, could you speak to us a bit about your, um, identity? I, I know you're asexual, right? Um, and you are also a romantic or yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we're talking about my orientation specifically, or also yes. my gender. Um, if everything you wanna you wanna you know share in as concrete a, a way as you can at this moment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll start with my gender and then go into my orientation, but they're related to me. Some people they're separate, but for me, they are saying that they're related to an extent. So my gender currently. I'll start with being general and being, then go to more specific. So in daily life, especially when I'm interacting with cis people, cis meaning people who yeah, aren't trans. Yeah, so yeah. they're assigned to gender at birth and they identify with that gender only, always, um, completely. Mm -hmm. um, so people, they, especially those who are not familiar with the LGBT tri plus community, I usually tell, tell them I'm a non-binary trans man. Mm -hmm. That's like me being general. Yes. In this case, I'm not offended that anybody calls me that because that's just, I identify with those terms, non-binary trans man. If I'm being specific, especially 
with my if in the trans community, especially other non-binary people. Um, I, I say I'm a poor, poor flex man adjacent. So what that means, a poor agenda, a, a, a poor agenda, so that's A-P-O-R-A-G-E-N-D-E-R, a poor agenda. Mm-hmm. So that means a, that's not a man or a woman, but mm-hmm. it still has a feeling. So it's not the same thing as a gender. So a gender, A-G-E-N-D-E-R, that's right. like a lack of gender or yes, not having yes, a gender. Yes, yes, yes. For a gender. But it's not a gender. It's just, it's still, it's still having a gender feeling or inclination, but just not a man or a woman. Yeah. So we're, we're saying... Abhorra in Greek that's, means, that's, means faint, um, you know, not, you know, the opposite of like firm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. A poor gender. And uh, that, so the prefix of poor, and then the suffix flux. So flux is mm-hmm. like as in fluctuate, mm-hmm. like the intensity of gender fluctuates. So when I'm saying a poor flux, that means that a poor a gender that's not a man or a woman, like that intensity of it, it like it changes. Mm-hmm. So that's what a poor flux is. And then I say man adjacent. And I, interestingly enough, I remember I was filling out the non-binary, they have this gender non-binary survey that goes out every year. Mm-hmm. That a non-binary person does. It's, it's called the non-binary census or something like that. So I sprung it out and it was asking, like, you know, how would you describe your gender in words? And then I think of the word man adjacent and I was like, is that a thing? Because I wonder, I wonder, I'm like, is that something I'm making up or is that like something that's established? And you like to say, even if you come up, even if you're the one coming up with the term, that's still as valid as if it's other people came up with it or it's been around for a long time. So I'm looking up, uh, oh no, so this is like a gay man adjacent, because I, I really relate to experiences of gay men specifically, as opposed to like straight men. So when I was looking up a like, gay man adjacent, I, I, I mostly saw it in people using it more as a joke, like like straight men who were like maybe more feminine, or, or like gender non-conforming, or, like, or even like taking on roles that are considered for women, like gender roles, like say like the cook, um, mm-hmm. like say like the cook. Or, and things like that and like basically using it in terms of gender roles but I'm like reclaiming it and like not in terms of like gender roles but in like terms but, but like my experiences of gender really me connecting more to gay men as opposed to like straight men and my experiences so I put gay men adjacent even though that my internet search didn't come up with the results I was hoping but I was like you know what I'm gonna use this term and even if other people are using it as a joke I can use it for my identity so that's the first time I ever used it and then after that, I thought about it some. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make that. Like, no, I'm going to use it for myself. Like, man adjacent. So I say adjacent. As in, like, I don't completely identify as a guy, but I feel like I'm, like, partially do or, like, close there. That's why I say adjacent. So, like, my, the gender, if I'm being specific, as I said, it's a poor flux man adjacent. And that's what I'm being specific. Um, in terms of, like, being, when being general, when I say I'm a non-binary trans man, how, actually, I have a friend, I have another friend, he 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 does have a non-binary trans man or gender queer trans man, and so it's not sure. The gender queer um, for some people, some people use non-binary and gender queer interchangeably, but that's not the case for everybody. Because like, I identify as non-binary, but not as gender queer. So some people take on gender queer like when they don't, when other gender labels don't feel quite right for them, like they feel like gender queer fits. So some people use it to mean gender non-conforming. Some people mean it to mean you can be cis and gender queer. You switch gender. Or you can be non binary. Yeah, exactly. and gender yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. He has like, both non binary and gender queer as well as trans men. And I remember for a long time, I'd be like, wow, I wish I was a guy. I wish I was a trans guy. And I just thought, I thought I had those thoughts because, oh, I just want more privilege. I like, as a non binary person, you know, there's a lot of pressure that goes with it. And I thought maybe that's why I had those thoughts. Mm. Um, but, I, I I never asked until I finally asked myself, wait, what if you are a guy? And I was like, wait a minute. I was, I never thought to ask myself, hey, what if you're a guy? It's like, cause I, and a big part of being non-binary is just a big part of my identity. And it's like, I don't have to leave my identity as being non-binary to also identify as a guy. I can identify as both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. That's exactly what it means, non-binary, that you can do that. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. So before I go on to orientation, do you want to talk about your, your gender father? Yeah, I felt that, yeah, let's talk about the, your orientation, um, if we can, for a minute, where you're at right now in your, in your, in your journey. Okay, yeah, yeah I think I can talk about it. You can go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
So my orientation, and again, so I did, I did definitely contextually whether I'm being general or if I'm being specific. So if I'm being general, you should say I'm gay because like, you know, as an overarching term, being gay as in I'm not straight. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like a specific, I'd say I'm omni, aromantic, asexual. So what do these terms mean? So uh, some people get confused, especially because omni is like, like what's like so omni? So omni is like attraction to all genders, yeah. but still having a uh, like, gender is still a factor in your attraction. So in my case, I tend to be into um, men and non-binary people the most often. I can be into women, but just not as often. Mm-hmm. So that's why I go by so then people are like, wait, how are you attracted to all genders and then asexual and aromantic? So how I explain it to them is that there's so many different forms of attraction. So um, even though I lack sexual attraction in terms of asexual and lack romantic attraction in terms of aromantic, I still can feel other attraction, attractions, like aesthetic, like the visual appearance. Mm. And then there's all attraction. Alters is like an emotional closeness. It's not romantic or platonic. But it's still like a significant like emotional like connection or emotional bond. So I mm-hmm. tend to feel aesthetic attractions the most often. And like for me, that's important to my identity. Mm. So so yeah, so specifically um omni aromantic sexual and I recently added the term homo flexible to my identity. So my the same point I was talking about, I make a joke that I like stole his identity. But like, like he identifies um uh, as um a homosexual non binary trans man. And I was like, you know, I was and it's like and you, you know I've, I've known him since like high school and I'm like person in college now. And it's like it's literally just now occurring to me it's like, hey, I can identify like this too. <laughs> it's what is interesting enough. So like in my case when I say homosexual, so I feel like that's specific. So that helps describe like my omni orientation so like omni an omni person who they're more attracted to depends so not another person that is omni they may be into women more often they may be into non-binary people more often they may be into women and non-binary people more often so like it depends on which omni person so what we have in common is all genders and then which gender we're into more often is what varies so when i say i'm homo homo flexible so h-o-m-o yeah f l IBLE, yeah, homo yeah. flexible. That, that since I'm non-binary trans man, in my case, like, you know, um, the homo part, like being attracted to men and non-binary people the most often, and flexible part, I can still be into women. Right. And then yes. um, Omni is spelled for those not familiar, O, M, and I. So putting it all together, homo flexible, Omni, aromantic, asexual. Or short, aromantic, asexual can be shortened to arrow A. But some people don't know what arrow A is. Can it to what? Like the whole thing. Huh? Aero S? Aero S? Aero S, yeah. Aero, I guess, Aero for aromantic. Mm-hmm. And then A mm-hmm. for asexual. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to be sure, I could say homosexual omni Aero A. Mm-hmm. But, like, I'm, I'm careful with who I say it because some people aren't familiar with the short name. So, I have to be, make sure I clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm in love. I'm in love with this whole process. <laughs> I am. <laughs> like, why did it take so long? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel so. I'm like, so grateful you for your generation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Farah. Speak yeah, to us. no, it's it's like and Rose and Ro and I are ten years apart. We're not like there's not that many generations between us right Mm -hmm. but I I still listening to Ro I'm just like like uh Z is like I can do this I can do this like every time they they add on one uh like another descriptor to their identity it's it's like that affirmation of I can do this and I just it just makes me smile you know to like exactly yeah to to insist right upon like like owning you know your identity in such a specific way and um yeah I feel like uh I'm so grateful like just to to hear it because like I feel like I still have I'm still un- unpacking the baggage from yeah you know yeah my generation and um yeah it's just it's lovely and yeah I can talk about my identity or we can talk about you know you're to see wherever you want to go I don't Yes, please. You can talk about your identity. I did. F- f- I, I'll take a moment because I wanted to yeah. share a, a thought that I had. The thought that came to me is that um, you know language works by creating difference, 
there is no other th there is no other way so the reason we're even in this like long standing binary uh, construct construct made of binary terms um is that that's how language as we know it has been given to us you know there is the thing and it's opposite and you can say that everything contains its opposite but as you speak you're not able to express that because you know you're going to say something and it will most likely be perceived as the opposite of something else. So we understand things more by what they're not or, or what they're not allowed to be than, you know, by what they actually are, their essence. So I feel that, you know, there is definitely a, a, an act of resistance, a revolutionary act in, in choosing not to go down that path. And even though you're only able to speak for yourself, and don't feel that, you know, you can speak for, for everyone. Um, you know, living by as an example and kind of like spreading this as an option um, for everyone, I feel is, is, a, is a kind of lingu linguistic um, evolutionary step, right? Because, you know, you model how we can take pretty much anything, even though in this case it's pronouns. And, 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 and change it enough to take it out of that, you know, binary setup. That is how meaning has been constructed for us all. And yes, it's uncomfortable. Because like we, but, yeah, but like if, if you stop and think about it, I must have been uncomfortable when we were like two and three that, we had to learn and memorize those specific sounds uh, as meaning, you know, the specific meanings that we were told they had to mean or else we would not be understood or we might have been punished. So that discomfort already happened. It just happened at the time that we don't quite remember because we didn't articulate then the way we articulate now. We weren't trained. <laughs> You're right. It was like before we were trained. So if we agree that the system, uh, you know, it, it is created to to facilitate the, the you know the prosperity and the well-being of, of, of the few and is uh, you know unjust because it's not inclusive, then we gotta kind of go to that beginning and say, well, that was a place of discomfort. So if it feels uncomfortable to have to insist on this and, and to have to ask to be respected and to have to, you know, change the way we communicate. This is why. <laughs> and this is why it matters. And, and, and this is the work that we're doing. And, and that's why I personally, you know, respect it so much. That's how I, I perceive it and that's why I respect it. So yes, Farah, if, would you like to speak to us about your um, orientation and you know pronoun choices, anything else? <laughs> yeah, no, I really wanted to just hone in on um, something that everyone's touching up on, and it's um, erasing difference. Mm. You know, and how the dominant logos um, and dominant language does that. And so I think at this point in my, in my life, you know, I, I used to be, um, I, I, I want to be friends and be in relationship with people across differences. And I don't want my difference to be erased. Um, and so that's my intention now with my language. Um, and so, for example, for my identity, like, I, I used to say like, oh, like I, like, just don't label me, you know? And, but the thing is when you um, try, say, don't label me sexually, don't label me gender wise, right? Um, and, and my gender identity, and my orientation and my identity, you get erased, you know? Um, because it's just, in, in one sense, it's, it's, it's freedom because, uh, you're not like uh, making yourself fit into any specific designation or box, right? But at the same time, you're not seen in an affirmative way. Um, you're 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 taken to be seen or framed in like a very moment to moment um, 
yeah, a moment to moment picture, right? And then where's the continuity or where's the the framing that like others kind of need in order to see you fully? So like, for example, um, right now uh, I, um, my, uh, I like to speak about my gender first, my, um, my gender identity as a non-binary person. Um, I, I've had so much gender dysphoria just being because especially now at this point, um, when I get stressed, whatever, my body becomes a lot more quote unquote, you know, just curvy and, um, it, it tends to make me be read more as like a woman, you know, and, um, I, you know, in the beginning of my gender journey, there was a lot of, um, just dysphoria against, like, I just, I, I saw myself in my mind and the way that I like to present was always more boyish, um, uh, more, uh, just, it was really funny. Um, I have like a little, a little story. Um, I was seeing an intuitive therapist at the time, which, you know, someone that deals with the spiritual world. Um, and, uh, she told me and she, she functions with a binary and she's like, uh, I want you to, in one of the exercises, I want you to draw yourself as you see yourself. And so I did that drawing and she's like, you, you don't look like you have a gender. You look like an alien. Like when <laughs> she's like, we need to correct this. And I was like, <laughs> um, and she's a yeah, lovely. that's the word. Correct. That's the word. Yes. That's what, how they, yeah. Like yeah. she was like, that's the dreaded, <laughs> that's the dreaded. Yeah, the dreaded. <laughs> yeah. You got to discipline this, you know, uh -huh. you got to get this into shape. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I felt, I felt like there was something wrong with me. I was like, Oh, because yeah, I don't get, want to take see. you to correction facility. <laughs> <laughs> the gender correction. Facility. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. And so, and then I, I was dating also at the time, a trans man, um, who also, and, and just identified as a trans man, like used he, him pronouns, um, was completely like passing as a, as a male, a, a cis male, um, you know, from, from in, in a, in a public way. And so I was just like, um, I also don't, don't see myself as this, like as wanting to in the binary to seeing myself as a, as a man, you know? Um, yeah, and, I mean, that's a lot exactly. to unpack too, but that's as much as I, as I can say within like, a you know, the, the limits that we have. Right. Like, um, I don't see myself as also this like static identity, Yeah, you know, the static presentation. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, I don't like to um, tell other people what is the correct way right. to <laughs> no, no. <laughs> go about presenting their gender. Yeah. You know, if they need yeah, to sure. have, you know, surgery, they, you know, and um, that's, you know, that's that I, I believe yeah, like everyone everybody, has yeah. their own gender journey. Um, yeah. I, you know, I'm still wanting to, to get on on hormones at this point in my life. Um, at the very least, but um, that doesn't, I don't think that determines, you know, like. Right, yeah. How I like that, I'm gonna, that this is going to be my presentation as like the guy from GQ, like on, on the cover of GQ, right? Like, <laughs> no, <nah. laughs> no, nah. like, yeah. I'm not going for that. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, exactly. And so, yeah. yeah. And so, like, I guess. Um, so I do assert, I guess this is a, all to say, a, a long story to say that um, I, I started doing drag. I guess doing drag really allowed me to uh, step outside of uh, my everyday presentation and really ask myself to be creative with my, with my gender. Like, like Rosen has been like alluding to like, and, and you have too, you're to see like, this is a creative act. I get to be creative in the way I move in the world, in the way that I speak in the world, in the way that I'm embodied. Like I want to create it. And so 
um, when I started doing drag uh, back in 2016, it was the first time I was like, you know what, I'm going to do a drag show. And it was Miami's w Wigwood, Wigwood 2016. It was like the first one. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm down. And I ended up doing a 30 minutes like uh, performance art almost um, where I uh, didn't even script the whole thing. I had a scripted playlist. But I didn't like have any, everything choreographed at all. Like I had my props, I had my audience, and um, I I was having a conversation with them, with the songs, with my um, invocations to them, right, to come up on the stage to help me with you know this book, with this song, with being vulnerable um, about wh what my identity. Um, was and I was forming a language for it there as Fluid Dude. Fluid Dude was my 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 drag name at the time, and it was the most I can't even begin to tell you to be witnessed and to be creative with with a receiver on the other end was um, yeah like it really ha like it asked me to insist upon my identity but also yeah to practice it in real time and so that's when I was more sure I was like you know what like I really do feel like like there is a lot of dude about me that doesn't you know because we live in a patriarchal society I'm not allowed to inhabit this fluid space between you know Fada who, who you're speaking to and like this other person that is that is with me you know and, and that can't come out because we live in capitalism with all these transactions and just get to the point, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, got to survive. And like, there's not enough creative space for us, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Like, what cookies are we uh, tracing? What do you buy consistently? <laughs> yes. You know, what goods <laughs> do you produce? <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> what's your career what's your yeah. profession like yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. how do you command <laughs> res social respect yeah. yes <laughs> <laughs> right what's your status what's your yeah status? that's what's it your status <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah ouchy uh, yeah. that relationship <laughs> status <laughs> exactly exactly oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah like i don't I don't define myself by like my romantic relationships. Like, yeah, that's I can't even separate. imagine that ever answering that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you know. Um, but as far as my attractions and stuff, you know, I, I am not heterosexual. Um, <laughs> I would say uh, I, Rosen kind of introduced me to this concept because I didn't. I never felt like bisexual did did the the term, but being M spec, which is like uh, multisexual um right Rosa you can <laughs> um and so yeah I think that that for me is my attraction is you know is is queer it's it's just like yeah. you know and I can't tell you if it what body it's gonna come in and what um you know but I know that I'm not like I'm just not attracted I know for sure in a very traditional sense to like the ideal of whatever a heterosexual <laughs> um, partner is. So, yeah, that that one was far shorter and easier because I just I just feel like that's that's the best I can do right now. Um, I've had partners that are both, you know, cis women, cis men, and then gender gender queer, gender fluid, trans. So I I feel like it wouldn't be fair to just like. They, they go all over the, the spectrum. So I think M spec captures it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love it. Yeah, I think I, I probably am that too. Me and Rosen yeah. have been doing a lot of panels lately. And uh, that's great. I think I keep on having to, to bring up, um, I, I, maybe Ro can speak a little about this. I'm, I'm curious to hear them, I mean, to hear Z talk about this, about homonormativity. Mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in the queer scene mm -hmm. um, because people are, are, are making it interchangeable where homo means queer, um, but it's so much more. Exactly. So, yes. And then the normative. So maybe, maybe Ro or. or yeah. Yeah. Ro, please. Yes. So homo normativity is this idea and also these actions that seems to 
not, not team that actually does prioritize certain behaviors and identities. So home and like think about think about like what how are queer people or well we say queer but really gay people depicted in the media. A lot of times it's white cisgender monosexual gay men. So monosexuals and men only monosexuals and only attracted to one gender. So cisgender, monosexual, gay men, white, young or young, like living in the suburbs, they got married, adopt the kid, white picket <laughs> fence. Um, and that's that's that tends to be the depiction of people uh, in our community. So that's very that's that's like that's not most of our community. That's not I, I think yeah. it's, it's yeah. very, so the idea of home over two is that for straight people, that they they like that possibility the possibility. Like those are the only the only thing that they're gonna accept. And if you don't fit that description, they're not gonna accept you. And then people within our community, our community, our community and unfortunately, instead of using their privilege and betraying that privilege and um like you know, being accomplices to other gang liberation, they take that privilege and they and they're like, okay, and they throw all of the rest of us under the bus, which is really unfortunate. Especially there are more marginalized people. So people are talking to most of them, like MSFREC people, people of color. I, in my case, I'm an MSFREC person of color, like specifically black, um, Indian, and indigenous Jamaican. And like, I don't fit that mold whatsoever. I'm also polyamorous, so I'm attracted, I think we're talking to multiple people at once. And, and, but especially us who deviate from that hormone opportunity in multiple ways, that, that is, that basically society further marginalizing us even within our community which is really unfortunate yeah i you know i feel i feel the same you know i feel that the, this is how it happens uh, no matter what, you know, we look, we look back at our, at our history um, of resistance and whether it's, you know, civil rights, women's rights, um, and of course, you know, gender rights. Um, it's, it's the same. Um, it, it, it comes to the same, basically, you know, the, the overall system, system the systemization, the tendency to systemize, takes over and appropriates whatever, you know, the struggle is. So, um, you know, you have like a, a wave of feminism and then, yeah, women get the right to vote, but they still have to vote like basically either Republican or Democrat, you know, and the first woman who runs for president is Hillary Clinton. And I'm not going to, politicize this I don't have to we all know what I'm saying right so <laughs> that there, there are no choices except to you know n normatize yourself more and more and more and more in that kind of like empowerment that you have been given you know we have the first uh, president of color and we don't even get universal health care um, you know we we don't even close down Guantanamo. I mean, you know, the list is long, but I'll, again, I, I'll stop here because we know what we're saying. Um, so um, it seems that it always stops at the, at the, you know, not even performative level, you know, at like the tokenist level, right? And then uh, we're done. <laughs> we're done with that. We're post, you know, we're post feminist and now we're post racial <laughs> and now we're post gender and, you know, everybody like get back to work. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, you know, it, it feels that by taking this, uh, by, we win these little victories and when we give up on the, on the, you know, the actual battle that we were fighting um, and 10, 20 years down the line, we are faced with the consequences, which basically, if you put aside the details, the consequences are not much has changed, you know? So, you know, women, you know, like married women weren't allowed to have bank accounts, for example, um, until like, you know, a generation ago. And then, you know, they, they got to like get paid by their husbands, if their husbands were well off, for being, you know, House, housewives for being uh, for raising you know the children, um, so you get alimony. So uh, 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 in in a sense, this helps you know the people who have no income don't get anything from it, and then you know the the 
tiny minority uh, who are very well off, you know, have countless ways to get around it. Uh, plus, they use it to once again, right, objectify and commodify, uh, you know, and trophy uh, <laughs> uh, the you know, f the female body. So, in in a sense, you know, the, the woman is loot doesn't change, right? And I feel that you know, like gay marriage was important as a victory, but if we feel that, okay, now we got it, then, you know, in the end, actually it's an assimilation uh, channel. It's yet another way to, to be assimilated. And also it's a way for, you know, the, the, the normative, um, you know, the dominant culture to uh, present itself as enlightened, <laughs> you know, um, you, we, you know, we are so inclusive and accepting now, <laughs> um, you know, because we like, you know, don't, don't put you, you know, in jail or, or don't like banish you uh, from work mostly and, um, you know, like m making money because of what you do in the privacy of your home. So, you know, but yeah, it, it's important to kind of every step of the way, you know, not, not um, be satisfied with the crumbs, you know, to kind of be conscious of where we are overall um, and how much further we want to go and how do we go. You know, we, we definitely don't get to the next stage by, you know, declaring like victory. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> It's um, tiny, tiny little, uh, it feels to me, you know, on, 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 from the point of view of like liberation, you know, tiny little steps out of the prison. Maybe one <laughs> step forward, one back, two forward, one back, kind of a little back. dance like that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what you're speaking to and I feel you practice is is so useful because it makes this real on a moment to moment daily basis. So it makes it much harder to kind of like, um, you know, feel that you're done or feel reassured, um, you know, or like kind of like turn your attention away to other normative things, you know, um, because it's something that you're doing on a daily basis. You're introducing and reintroducing yourself and asking uh, those around you, new people you meet, to experience this and, and think about mm -hmm. it for themselves. So it's like a checking in with yourself and your identity and your consciousness uh, continuously rather than saying, okay, this is the goal. I got this goal. And once like uh, I get achieved this, I'm done. Right. So I feel that that's, you know, the, the great the, the great, like, let's say, improvement <laughs> in the methodology, you know. It's only when the practice, the, the, the practice of resistance includes a daily check-in, you know, a daily practice that we, we you know, have some sor sort of, like, assurance mm -hmm. that we're going to, you know, continue, that we'll keep on it. Yeah, I think... Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I say, like, I feel like, I feel, but we definitely lack intersectionality in how we do that, and even more importantly, how we act. Like, I know you mentioned, like, Hillary Clinton as, like, the first woman president at the time, but that's actually not completely true. Like, even even when people say Shirley, Shirley Chisholm, so Shirley Chisholm, she was the first black woman elected to U.S. Congress, and then she also, she, and then people, during the time of Hillary Clinton and her candidacy, they're like, oh, how uh, actually show you she's on this black woman and uh, her her um her parents are, uh, are Caribbean um, specifically and her 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 dad is from Diana at that point British Diana and her mom is from Barbados so she's Guyanese and Bayesian um and but she was born in the United States and people were saying to be intersectional using that intersectionality framework and intersectionality is that the term was coined by Professor. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, like a black feminist legal scholar, basically saying that considering people's different identities and how that shapes a unique experience, especially relating to oppression. So they'll say, okay, Shirley, uh, not Shirley Chisholm is, was actually the first woman, but that's also not go back. You have to go back even further. So, so some of these specific things, okay, 
part of a major party. And as you were saying, like, you know, why is it that Democrat or Republican? So, like, in the case of Shirley and, like, and if Hillary, they're, they're a Democrat. But there was actually a woman even way, way before her, um, like her, which I just looked up, Victoria Woodhull. So she was in the Equal Rights, the Equal Rights Party in 1872, and she was, and she was a presidential candidate. But, uh, but we don't hear about her. And I feel like, and that's, and that's one of the problems. Like a lot of times in our analyses, and like when we look at history, like we really don't consider the historical continuity is like very insular in our thinking. And, I, and, that, and as we talk about language, that also goes, and it's very interconnected also to in language. So people, the dictionaries tend to be, for the most part, are going away from it, but people tend to think of this dictionaries as prescriptive, as in they right, tell us, okay, yeah. how, should talk, how should we write, how should we think, but really they need to be descriptive. Like, how do we actually talk? How do we actually think? How do we write and be that way? And we get into that descriptive language, then language is allowed more. Because language does evolve. People act like, oh, we're just making up words. Well, yeah, words don't just fall from the sky. We yeah, make them up. <laughs> yeah, someone made them up. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when we talk about pronouns, and it's go back to the historical continuity. Like, we say you use the term neo pronouns. So, like, my pronouns, the and it's called a neo pronoun. Because it's outside of she and he. But a lot of times, a lot of these pronouns outside of she and he aren't that new. Like, if you look back, like, eight. 1800s and even earlier you will see these pronouns and maybe they were and like and like just because they're not used as often anymore that doesn't make them new just because you don't know them that does not make them new and i even look at i remember i had a project and but and i i got into it like with my linguistic it's a linguistic professor and i was telling her my pronouns and she was misgendering me so i don't know and like you know i was correcting her and we got into talking about pronouns. She was talking about language. Or she was saying that, oh, there's certain things you can change the language, certain things you can't change. And she was claiming you can't change pronouns. I know that's false. Like, I know that's false. Like, when you look at the history, I'm like, well, the pronoun he was before the pronoun she. So before they say he, before the, like, whether you were man, woman, non-binary, like, they would use the pronoun he. And that's very, like, the like, you know, patriarchal structure as, like, men being the, the default. And unfortunately, there's still people to this day who still use he, like, like, like in legal documents and think that's all inclusive for the most, and it, it's not. You can't just refer to everyone as he. But for the most part, people are generally going to the idea, okay, yeah, you can't refer to everybody as he. But then they're still stuck using he and she. I'm like, we, we, for, the, for the most part, people aren't calling she a neo pronoun. But the she what didn't right. always exist was he, and then she came on later as, like, you know, women, like, it's not linear. Again, history isn't linear. Because there were, especially in indigenous cultures, where women had various positions uh, and like were with their different positions of power and then especially your centrism with like really with your centrism and imperialism imposed like misogyny in various cultures. So like so going from that and then to like okay women, specifically white women going into the public sphere and okay we we refer to as she and like you try to refer to everyone so you have he and she and then now like not now but there's, we're again realizing there are more ways to refer to people because there are different types of people as in they and people are, people act like this is new but language evolves over time, time. And sometimes it's not even an evolution it's just like re-remembering re-signing, rediscovering like these have already, already existed and people know about it and a lot of times like and unfortunately especially when there are people of color women of color and are binary they're not giving credit yeah, absolutely. So true. And lot, yeah, lots and lots of, of, of uh, people have not, not gotten credit through history. Um, and yeah, I feel that, you know, naming in particular is so arbitrary. Like if you think of it, um, you know, like even in my case, and I am like, you know, contemporary in, in a sense, but, you know, I, uh, my name is the name of a, my last name, which is my father's last name. Um, because like, you know, theoretically he owned me, <laughs> uh, when I was born. So I belonged to him. So I had his first name was my middle name. Uh, his name is George. So my name when I was born, as it is for all, uh, you know, children in Greece is Eurydice, George, meaning implying of George, and then Cambyses his last name, which happens to be the name of an ancient Persian king, um, 
who went mad. But my, my point is when I <laughs> went to <laughs> um, try to conquer Egypt and went insane. <laughs> Farah, <laughs> of course. <Yeah. laughs> like, why would you try to do that? Um, but anyway, when I, you know, when I went to English school, so English was my third language. So after I got my back in French, I studied English on the island of Crete. And like this, you know, the lady uh, who, who taught me English, who was born and raised in Crete, had, you know, her own understanding of translating things like names. So she wrote my name in the way that she thought it sounded phonetically. And that's what I had to show that I had passed the TOEFL test, basically. So I went by that very arbitrary name spelling. That's not even how my own, you know, father or uncles or sisters spell our last name. Uh, you know, my whole like, academic career after that because I needed that paperwork right which is reminiscent of like so many of our um, you know recent or, or further removed ancestors coming to this country in all kinds of ways whether it's like through Ellis Island or you know as slaves or, or whatever and given completely arbitrary arbitrary names shortened names you know normative names or willingly changing names in order to to not be uh, you know censored or or um, face, you know, discriminated against. So, yeah, you know, naming, which is part of what the pronouns are, has always been arbitrary, especially in this, in, in this like multilingual world we live in, where we're constantly, you know, trying to translate each other's, you know, com complex um, inherited genetic, you know, lineages in like common languages, in, in languages that are not our native ones. So I, I feel that, you know, that happens. It's just that when it doesn't happen with intention, it doesn't seem to uh, bother anyone. <laughs> when it when it doesn't include our own intentionality, then it's like, oh well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what happens. It's life, <laughs> right? Um, because we are disempowered in the process. So that's accept more acceptable somehow socially than when we're the ones doing the naming. Yeah, but I I feel that. You know, as I as I said before, it's in fact um, you know very respectful of of the audience, of the listener, of the of the companion, you know, of the coworker, because it it shows that you know what we take time to care not just about ourselves and how you know we we may be perceived, but about their understanding it, uh, you know, their participation in it, and. Um, and I also appreciate, um, you know, the the effort to be clear, lucid, and specific about your, uh, you know, preferences in your orientation. Because um, again, you know, we traditionally, especially as women, you know, have been thrown this, you know, kind of like huge con construct of romance and all the things that we uh, should naturally. Um, you know, give up in exchange for like being, you know, romantically uh, wanted and and approved <laughs> um, and kind of like fixed. <laughs> so, so, you know, being able to even say I have an aesthetic attraction and that's it, right? <laughs> oh, like I find that so liberating in its specificity, you know, as, com as compared to like, well, I'm attracted to someone physically, therefore I'm in love, therefore uh, Cinderella or, you know, whatever you, like the normative childhood scenarios that come up with you, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like a whole echo of all that comes, you know, into your consciousness and you're not even aware um, so yeah the, the gift of, of of linguistic specificity is is exactly that that you know you we we are able to you know take a moment to allow ourselves to you know to separate our, our truth from like the overall non-stop running you know um, narrative that that has its own interest you know in like propaganda and for propaganda purposes yeah in the in the in the systemization right that 
and the normative, um, you know, uh, interests of, you know, our oppressors. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Of the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, those who, who run it, you know, because I, mm-hmm. I feel that, um, you know, a, a lot of what happens is not so much a, a matter of like government is a matter of, you know, capitalism and, and, you know, the accumulation of, of capital and, and those who are, you know, running those systems, um, who I feel, you know, unfortunately must be, you know, kind of like far removed from their humanity. (laughs) I mean, I I don't know many of them personally or maybe any of them personally. Say that that again, (laughs) that they're destroying humanity? No, I feel that they are divorced from their own humanity. That I, even though I don't know them personally, you know, um, I can only imagine that they are, you know, divorced from their humanity. Because if, you know, if they came from a humanitarian existence, they would probably find it very hard to, like, you know, quantify everything and and understand it in terms of, like, you know, profit margins or um, logistics or, you know, all those uh, ways of, of turning life into, um, you know, spreadsheet (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. they need the most um love (laughs) if that's the word (laughs) yeah the love and the the curiosity about other you know yeah other ways of being yeah (laughs) So um, I hope, you know, I, I, I also wanted to say that, you know, I, I hope that you um, find ways to, you know, follow and practice your career and your work um, outside academia. Because <laughs> um, I, fe- I feel that that's been another, you know, way that at least in recent decades, you know, the the overall, you know, structure, the patriarchy has found to kind of like isolate um, voices of difference, you know, when the only job you can find basically with benefits is in academia, then everybody speaks to each other. um, And in the overall culture, they, we, you know, are stigmatized as elite um, and, and as like not being in touch with the people, um, you know, and, um, and it becomes a little too esoteric or rarefied, at least it's, it's viewed that way. So, it, you know, the discourse and the exchange loses some of its, uh, loses a lot of its, of its effect and, and power, you know, in the social arena. Um, and um, as a writer, I have found that to be true very much about, about writing, you know, and creative writing. We kind of like tend to, you know, replicate uh, what can get published, w- which can get us like a job in the, in the system, which then can get us, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, another publication and, you know, uh, maybe uh, a promotion. And then, of course, like, you know, the great uh, white whale of tenure. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So, you know, yeah, like uh, kind of like at least being conscious of, of, you know, finding ways to, to practice, to work, to, to, you know, belong, to join um, that, are, you know, that are in, in the, in the daily existence of the people um, and not in like the you know ivory tower of uh, of academia, I think is um, is important as part of of being an activist. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna add uh, Eurydice to that. That um, in the beginning when we were introduced, uh, you mentioned that I was in FIU's MFA program, um, but I actually yeah. I didn't. You know, <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. But I I left. The, at first, the MFA, because of a, a medical leave that I took, I was having, trying to figure out what was going on with my health, um, with my immune system. 
Um, and then I, I, I had the option of returning, but um, it, it was calling to me to more so like uh, study environmental uh, justice and in the frame of literature. And, um, you know, and I just never went could bring myself to go back to the MFA because I very much this feeling of, of normalizing and creating like um, a, a very specific voice that's going to uh, get me into publications. It felt like, you know, since that, like you said, the great white whale of publication and tenureship was like the end all be all. I really found a lot more freedom um, of, of thoughts in just, you know, creating my own thesis that didn't, um, you know, and being, being, having the resources to just kind of spend time with the books and the literatures, right. Um, that were more activist oriented. And what I'm doing right now is, um, focusing on like, what is an activist poetics, Yeah, you know, um, and how do they deal with the violences? How do they address violence from cultural to environmental? And so, um, I think that allows me to be much more exploratory um, than uh, what, it, like, I don't know, a, a traditional MFA program. And yeah, I definitely have my feet on the ground as far as like resistance and and struggling. Um, I'm I'm definitely, uh, you know, yeah, very all of my all of my pra- I, I try to do a, have a praxis you know, of, of, of the theories that, that I, that I, you know, encounter and mm-hmm. my own mm-hmm. and put them into translate into action, which is really why I'm, I'm, I'm so happy uh, Roe uh, started the rainbow rights pack because it's, it's, you know, even though it's like a new, a new org, there's still a lot of, um, it, you know, uh, it's just to have that community there to, to that coalition to just kind of galvanize, right. Especially now. Um, yeah. yeah. Part of what we can do um, is to, you know, set up collectives or groups to, you know, make a, an effort to like come together, even if it is like this on Zoom or on the phone, you know, once a week um, and, uh, and also find ways to enter the, the system of, you know, production, content production, um, you know, and, and the same way that you know, we can kind of like create our identity, you know, we can create the content, we can affect, right, the content that's being shared. Um, and there is really no other way, you know, got to get, make it all accessible, as accessible as possible. So, you know, we, um, mm-hmm. so more and more people who feel like this and um, haven't, you know, perhaps been exposed to the different, you know, languages and possibilities, right? Uh, Get that access. Yeah. So thank you for joining me. Um, Thank you so much for this conversation. I hope we have another soon. (laughs) Uh, And it was a pleasure getting to, um, you know, know you, Ro, and thank you, Farah, so much. Um, So, and everyone out there, Thank you for uh, listening to us and uh, until next week, keep speaking sex. If I could make love incessantly, I would be God.